Hi everyone, this is Mike with episode 57 of Getting Everyone Moving, brought to you by Palms of Pines Parasports. And today we have a Paralympian, Emily Hoskins. Hi, Emily. Hi there. So how, tell us how you got involved with wheelchair basketball and adaptive sports and all that. Um, well, so I've been disabled from birth. Um, I was born with with cancer on my spinal cord, but I did not, even though being in a being in a chair my whole life, I did not know wheelchair sports existed until I was about 13 or 14. Um, oddly enough, my parents were on a ski trip in Canada and they met someone who was an adaptive skier. And they just kind of mentioned like, oh, we're you know I was in a wheelchair and apparently the guy was like well what sports does she play and my parents were both like what, what are you talking about and uh -huh. and uh we sort of got connected from from there uh -huh. um so growing up then um it sounds like your parents are pretty supportive uh, oh my gosh extremely yeah talk, talk, extremely. A, talk a little bit about that and how they I don't know if they pushed you or I would say pushed, I would say encouraged. Um, I wanted to do these things. And um, we, I'm from a very, very small town in Southern Illinois called Mascuda. And it's about 25 minutes uh, east of, of St. Louis. So there is in uh, St. Louis, there's adaptive sports available. And I kind of tried out a couple. Um, initially, I did track and field, I did ski, uh, snow skiing, I did um, basketball, but basketball was the one that I really loved. Um, but, you know, as we all know, adaptive sports often come with incredible costs, you know, equipment, um, also lots of travel. Um, the junior basketball team that I played for, the St. Louis Rams, um, a lot of our expenses for travel and things were paid out of pocket. Um, my parents, thankfully, were um, able to, to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we went to everything, anything, any sports I wanted to do, um, any, you know, getting equipment and things like my, my parents were extremely supportive. So which other sports have you participated in during your uh, life? Um, yeah, uh, track. I, and it was funny because everyone, when I, when I first started track, everybody was like freaking out, like, oh my gosh, you have so much potential. You could be so good at this. And I just didn't really, it wasn't my thing. Um, and so I did it for like two years, but then I decided I just wanted to focus more on basketball, which oddly enough, like I was not very good at basketball. You would have never thought I had a, a you would have never predicted my future career based on when I played juniors. Um, but I've also, in addition to basketball, I tried tennis for a while. Um, tennis is a little too like proper and polite for me. I, I like, I like where you can be a little more aggressive. Um, you know, I've tried a bunch of different things over the years. Water skiing. That's really fun. Done that like once or twice. Um, with able youth, I've gotten to try some other different things too, that I met, you know, I'm, I'm always down for trying something at least once. Uh, so do you feel there's, um, I mean, obviously there are challenges, right? Um, oh. Is there anything that you feel you can't really do? Um, carry two things at once. I, that's always my running joke. I can't being in a chair. I can't carry. I can't carry one thing in both hands. Um, but that's that. That's my joke. Uh, but no, otherwise, no, not really. I I don't know. There, I pretty much do anything. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. There's not really much I've ever been like. No, I can't do that. Yeah. So what is it? Um, you know, internally that uh, you know pushes you to feel as if, you know, hey, so I use a chair. Okay, big deal. Um, yeah, what what is it inside of you that makes you go? You know, I mean, what other choice do I have? You know, I'm, I'm not, I've been disabled my whole life, so I don't know any different. Um, I know for people that, you know, become disabled later in life from an accident or illness or something, um, you know, I know that's a huge transition for a lot of people, but again, it's kind of what other choice do you have? Um, and it's funny because, um, it, it, it's funny because a lot of people, uh, I work as a, a mental health therapist. I work with kids and I've been doing counseling via video <laughs> over the last year. Yeah. And it's funny to me, sometimes I recognize that like kids that I've like newer clients in the past year may not 
know that I'm in a wheelchair. You know, they only see me from shoulders up. And so it's, it's funny kind of like, oh, right. Yeah. I, I'm in a wheelchair. You, you don't know that yet. <laughs> you know, so it's, I, I don't know. It's just something that's not a huge, uh, I don't know. It's not something that's a huge barrier, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you went to the University of Illinois and then you were also a Paralympian. I mean, I, I, mm-hmm. this, describe both of those experiences uh, for us. Ooh, we're going to need more hours. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> When, when, as I said, when I played um, in juniors and when I was in high school, um, I was approached by uh, the the coach at the time, um, Mike Frogley. Um, he was the coach for the men and women's teams at the University of Illinois. And he approached me when I was maybe a junior in high school about co- possibly coming and playing college ball. And I remember literally being like, are you, do you mean somebody else? Like, do you, do you know, like, did you see me sit the bench the whole game? I, I literally thought he had the wrong person. Um, but, you know, we started talking and I, I went to camps every summer at Illinois and, and it was like, no, this is what I want to do. Um, and I played um, uh, five seasons at Illinois and, um, you know, as with many college athletes, you know, your early years, you sit on the bench a lot more than you, you play. Um, but I played with probably like the most awesome group of women that has ever played on a basketball team together ever. Um, and so, you know, and, and kind of moved up the ranks and then my scene, you know, you get more playing time as you go yeah. on. I, the first U.S. Paralympic team that I made, the first national team was in 2003. So not a Paralympic year, but kind of a developmental year where um, Ron Likens, who was the U.S. Paralympic coach at that time, uh, took kind of a developmental team of eight of us to, um, to Argentina for a tournament. Um, several of those women then later on ended being, you know, teammates on other uh, U.S. teams over the years. Uh in 2004, that was my first Paralympic year, but a lot of people don't know this. I actually did not make the team initially. Um, I was I, I was named as an alternate. You can only take 12 women on a, on a Paralympic team, and I was basically the 13th. And I traveled with the team to training camps. I, I did all the workouts. You know, I did everything yeah. as though I would be going, but with the knowledge that I wasn't. So that was hard sometimes emotionally because it's like, you know, we'd be talking about them going and I'd be sitting over here like, oh, right, I'm, yeah. I'm not going with them. But about, I believe it was about nine days, something like that, before we were to leave, before the team was to leave to, to, to go to Athens. I actually was in an airport. I had been visiting a friend. I was flying home and I got a call from Ron and and. If you don't know Ron, he uh, can be a little intimidating. He's mellowed out over the years, but um, he called me. He was like, Emily, we need to speak immediately. Scared <laughs> the hell out of me. I was I was like, what did I do? I'm in trouble. Oh, my gosh. And um, unfortunately, one of my other teammates had come down with a, a medical issue. She was OK. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, that was my first question when they, they said who it was. My first question is this. Is she OK? Sure. Um, she was. But um, she was not cleared to to compete. And so Ron basically was like, all right, get ready. You're you're coming with us. And it was I mean, I, I don't know the exact date, but I want to say it was less than 10 days. And it was like, um, and here's the other funny part of that story. Um, We had a training camp a few days later and Ron made me promise that I could not utter a word about it. He said, you can tell your parents and that's it. And um, he said, don't even tell Frog. Like nobody, nobody can find out about this. You know, he wanted to break the news to the team as a whole, um, which I get and respected, but Ooh, that was the longest three days of my life, not being able, knowing that I'm going and not being able to utter a word to anybody other than my mom and dad. So, yeah. Um, so played in, in Athens in 2004, where we uh, won gold and, um, you know, then made the team every year after that, um, you know, because between Paralympics, there are, you know, different Parapan American games and North or, um, Gold Cup and everything um, and played. And then 2008 came around and um, 
you know, I was unsure uh, if I would still make the team because that year in particular was a really tough spot for class one O's. And I made the team and, and was in the starting lineup that year. And, you know, a big, not that everyone is not a part of a part of the team and sure. everybody's important, but definitely seeing more court time. That's what, that's how I'll phrase it. Seeing a lot yeah. more court time. So they were two extremely different experiences for, for me. Yeah. Uh, both were amazing, but very different experiences. Well, well, talk about the feeling of, I mean, you know, you're an elite athlete. Um, you're on a world stage. Uh, I mean, what is the feeling? Do you, do you remember, you know, playing and getting your medal and all that? Oh yeah, totally. You know, it's, it's, and again, it is weird because I definitely have, again, they were two very different experiences for me. Um, you know, and, and 2008, like I, this sounds dramatic, but I really felt in 2008, like if we had not won gold, I literally feel like my heart would have just stopped working. I would have just died. Like that's, I know how dramatic that sounds, but I literally felt like that, like working so hard all through 2008. Um, I didn't, after I made the team, I, I was in grad school at the time. Yeah. I had, I think a month left of grad school, but then as soon as that was over, I threw my ball chair a suitcase and stuff in my car. And I spent the summer just traveling around, staying and training with different teammates. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, yeah, I, I mean, I trained at least five, six days a week anywhere. I didn't, I didn't have a job. I was single. I literally didn't have anything else in my life going on. Basketball was it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, in training. And then, uh, you know, in 22, like in Beijing, um, it, our gold medal game, i I was later told that there were like 12,000 people in the crowd. And, and, but it's funny because when you're on the court, it none of those people are there. It's huh. my four other, you know, it's, it's my four other teammates that are on the court with me right now. And the five other women from the other team that are on the court right now. And, and it, it, it felt no different playing in front of 12,000 people than it did playing in front of like 12 people. You know, it just, huh. And then it's funny, my, my, my parents went to both Paralympics yeah. and in 2008, well, actually both of them, but I remember them saying, did you hear us cheering? We were yelling your name. I'm like, I, no, I didn't hear you. Like, ugh, of course I didn't hear you from the stand. I'm not paying attention to that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it was definitely like the, the most amazing experience of my life, both, both of them, especially 2008. Yeah, I often, it, it's interesting what you just said about, you know, the crowd. I, I often wonder how pro athletes, you know, play in front of so many people, but you literally, I mean, you're so focused on the game that you really, you just block out everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really it's, it's the, the 10 women that are on the court right now and it's the coaches on the sidelines yelling at you. And that's, and that's literally for me anyway, that's all I noticed. That's amazing. Huh. How, how have you seen um, the game of uh, wheelchair basketball evolve, you know, in the time that you've played? What, what differences do you see? A, a lot. Um, you know, I started playing in a, I don't know the exact, it was probably about 97, 98, maybe. Yeah. Um, well, for starters, when I was, I graduated high school in 2001. And when I was going on, I, I was, you know, looking at schools, there were two schools in the country that had college women's wheelchair basketball teams. It was the University of Illinois and the University of Arizona. Um, now, I, I can't remember how many teams there yeah. are now in the college division and especially like particularly women's teams, but a ton more, like so many more options. Um the level of the game has has elevated tremendously you know i think I, I just you know the sport has grown over the years and i think the level of coaching has risen the level of athletes have risen there's so many more female athletes which is incredible um when i was playing we the st louis team we had three girls on our no four four counting me and we had more girls on our team i than almost any other team I, we'd ever played against um, and now there are, uh, you know, tons of, of young female athletes and there are camps specifically for 
female athletes and their college programs that are more and more growing every day. So, um, you know, that's been a huge, that's been a huge thing I've been excited about, but just again, the overall level of the game has elevated so much. Um, so when you come across, um, athletes, especially, uh, female athletes, how do you, um, how do you encourage them, you know, to just get in the game? So one of the things that whenever I do um, speak with with female wheelchair basketball player, junior athletes, I always tell them, like, hang in there because women's ball is so much more fun. Um, Don't get me wrong. I have tons of guy friends and all scrimmages over the years. I have tons of guys that I love playing with. But overall, playing with women is so much better. It's so much better. Um, I think women are just more team oriented. And so it's, it's, I don't know, it's just a better game. It's way more fun. And so I often tell, um, especially like take an example, if it's a junior female athlete that she's the only girl on the team, or maybe there's only two of them, you know, kind of telling her like, hang in there. Like when you get, you know, older and you can go play for like a women's program, like it's going to be so much better, whether, whether it's, you know, a college women's program or a community or club women's program. Um, you know, that's really one of my big things is pushing like hang in there. Cause it's going to get so much more fun. Yeah. Um, how do you see, um, I mean, do you see more colleges starting programs in the future? And can you foresee a professional league in the United States? Oh my gosh, that would be amazing. Uh, absolutely. I mean, college programs are, are always being built up. There are people, um, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn, so I'm not going to say any of them, but I, I, I'm aware of a few programs that are maybe tra- or schools that are trying to start programs. Um, and, and two, you know, even programs that exist that then later build on that program, like the University of Whitewater, Wisconsin is a great example. They had a, a, an extremely ex- successful men's team for many years, um, and they then developed a, a women's team. Um, and you know so so yes there's definitely going to be more and more teams college programs I think just people are more aware of the sport and more aware of the opportunities and a professional league in the U.S. would be amazing my only my only problem I have with that is that it didn't happen like 15 years ago so I could do it (laughs) I'm a little too old to, to play professional now but that would be my only only problem with it is if we didn't get it like a long time ago. Uh, are you still playing then? I mean, recreationally or? No, unfortunately. So I, um, this is my sixth season coaching. I coach, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and I coach a junior team here, um, the Music City Thunder. Um, this is my sixth season with them. And unfortunately, it is really hard to be a coach like a hundred percent for them, yeah. but also play, you know, because you're, you're, if, if, if I were still playing, you know, I'd be traveling on weekends and going to tournaments and yeah. that's when we practice and that's when the kids travel. So a few years ago, I kind of made the decision to sort of retire um, my own career so that I could kind of take over coaching. Now I will say I miss it a lot, especially yeah. when we, go and we see um like a higher level of play like if we a a great example is um the last couple years a group of our able uh able youth athlete athletes have gone down to auburn university for their uh junior summer wheelchair basketball camp getting to scrimmage with some of those college guys like over the summer just you know between breaks like oh my gosh i miss this so much Uh, i always joke with my kids too like i always joke that i'm gonna put a jersey on and sub myself in like i look like i'm still in high school right like i'm totally a junior i'm gonna come and play with you guys um but i do i do scrimmage with with the boys a lot um at practice and things but i definitely do miss playing but coaching's a pretty amazing experience in itself. So yeah, so you're really giving back um, to the youth. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. It cool. when my husband and I moved to Nashville, um, 2011, I think, and I kind of we were here for a few months before I sort of came across and discovered that there was a junior team here, yeah. and I emailed. Um, so our junior team is under an organization, a nonprofit 
called Able Youth. And the basketball team is just one part of Able Youth. But I basically, I reached out to the, the founder and executive, executive director, Rick Slaughter. And I more or less like sent him my athletic resume and was like, hey, I would love to come and help out and meet the kids. And, you know, I wanted him to know that like, I wasn't just some Yahoo off the street. Like I knew what I was, you know, I was like, I have a little experience. Um, I send him that email. Four minutes later, I get a call. And I think that first phone call, I think Rick and I talked for like over an hour. Um, and I began just kind of coming and helping out and volunteering here and there. Um, because I was still playing at that time. Um, and then we had um we had a couple of years where we had some changes in coaches and Finally, it was like, okay, you know what? They need a stable coach that's going to be with them for more than one or two seasons. And, and so then I, I took over doing that. That's terrific. Um, how do you um, see us, or how can we get more, develop a more inclusive society? Um, I mean, it's a big question, but what are some of the things that, you know, we might be able, that we should be doing to create more inclusion? Well, one, I mean, just basic accessibility. So many things in this world are frustratingly not accessible yet. And, you know, that makes it that makes it hard for people. And the other thing too, accessible for a variety of disabilities, you know, not just manual chairs, but also power chairs, or not just wheelchairs, but people with visual impairments, people with, you know, all kinds of different, you know, um, disabilities and things and accessibility is not that difficult i think sometimes people think it has to be this huge huge barrier and it doesn't a lot of it's just freaking common sense so i think just in general basic accessibility is a huge one um i think also just like when it comes to adaptive sports getting the word out you know again it, it sometimes it boggles me that I lived with a disability from the moment I was born and we didn't even know wheelchair sports existed until I was 13. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and a lot of it's word of mouth. Um, my husband kind of laughs at me because if we are out in public and I see a kid in a wheelchair, I'll I, like literally like in a grocery store, I remember running down like four aisles because I saw a kid in a wheelchair and like, hey, do you want to play with Ultra basketball, probably scaring him, but um, you know, but it is, it's word of mouth. My, that's how my parents discovered, that's how we discovered wheelchair sports. Literally, my parents just meeting somebody at a randomly in a, on a ski trip. Um, and so just visibility, you know, um, one of the big ones being that the Paralympics could be televised. Um, all of it, not just like a few hours. I mean, we're making headway, but come on, yeah. like yeah. There's a little lot of room to grow there still, but just, you know, visibility, um, getting the word out and, and, you know, the other th cool thing is, is yes, certainly some sports are more popular than others. Wheelchair basketball, probably one of the more popular ones, yeah. but there's all kinds of other adaptive sports that people don't know about, you know, like, um, there, uh, what is on Netflix a few months ago that came out with a documentary, I believe it's called Rising Phoenix and it's yeah. about, yeah. yeah uh the, the the fencer the the i don't know if the fencer is the right fencer, word but yeah. the one who does fencing i was like that's incredible i want to try that like you know <laughs> i didn't really know that ex i mean i did from being a paralympian but like i don't know i didn't i didn't know that much about it so you know just these different things that that people are doing and just trying to get visibility just trying to get it out there so people can see yeah. it and learn about it um I, I just read a book about the history of disability in the United States, which was fascinating. And, you know, I've seen Crip Camp and all that. Yeah. And you realize that, you know, it hasn't been that long, right? Since disability took on more of a rights-based approach. And I think, you know, people such as yourself um, and many others who are really, you know, advocating now, I, you know, in the longer term, obviously it will make, you know, a huge difference. Yeah. 
I, I have kind of a, a story from Beijing when we were there that I feel like was just like kind of mind blowing. So we had one day off while we were there where um, the coaches allowed us to go out and be with our families or whatever. So I did my my parents and I just kind of we found a little area of town and just kind of walked around, had lunch. It was nice to just hang out, you know, be out of the Paralympic Village for a few hours. Well, we're walking and there's like all these shops and we noticed this woman who is probably in their like 80s, this this Chinese woman who kind of was, was following us, but like kind of like she was kind of du like ducking around and, and we kind of we didn't really know what was going on. We were like, well, we don't think it's like a pickpocket or anything, but she's definitely following us. And when, then later that evening, when I got back to the Paralympic Village, I I was kind of talking about that, but it was just a little odd. And we had a woman that, um, a, a Chinese citizen who kind of was volunteering and kind of, yeah. you know, just helping our team out. And she explained, she said, oh, no, I, like, she said, honestly, you're probably the first person in a wheelchair that that woman has ever seen in her life. She's like, she, she's probably just very curious. She's like, we don't, especially she said, I guess in that part of town, she was like, yeah, we just, it, the city's not, people with disabilities and people in wheelchairs are not out in public. And, and just, that was kind of mind blowing because this was definitely a very elderly woman. You know, she had had many years on this planet and was like, wow, I'm the first time she's seen a person with a disability. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very poignant story. Um, when I lived in India, um, I was working in the field of developmental disabilities with the Indian government. And, you know, one of the myths was that disability is a punishment from the gods. Right, you know, but but that's, you know, still, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so. so we're coming to the end of our interview. And um, do you have some final words that you'd like to leave our listening audience with? Gosh. Um you know, to, to anyone who, who might be listening that has a disability, if there's a sport, if there's an activity you want to do, I don't care if it's like hang gliding or kayaking or whatever, there's going to be an option out there. There's going to be somebody out there who is doing it, has figured out a way to do it. Um, you know, whatever it may be, there's somebody who is doing it and there are ways that you can do it too. I would say to those who, um, who might be listening that don't have a disability, like don't freak out around people with disabilities. It's not that big of a deal, you know, um, and try to be inclusive and try to, you know, don't assume that someone can't do something. Um, don't assume that, you know, oh, we're not going to invite them on the canoe trip because they, they probably can't do that, you know, or whatever it may be. Just, uh, I don't know. And, and people with disabilities too one last thing i think you know wheelchair basketball obviously is amazing and it's it's one of the best things ever in my life but i will also say that wheelchair basketball also more importantly open doors for education career um friendships um some of the most amazing people best friends in the entire world are people that i have played with or people that I've played alongside with. And, you know, and again, wheelchair basketball, especially there are other college programs and things, but um, more importantly than athletics uh, is academics that it can get, provide you an education to have a career beyond wheelchair basketball. Such as you have. <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh, well, my, my, my work with Able Youth, that's like my fun job, my, my, my full-time job. That's, that's the, what pays the bills. <laughs> well, Emily, thank you so much. This has been a delight to talk to you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.